Charles Martin was a weak heavyweight champion. There's no question about it. He won the title against Glaskov by default because Glaskov was injured. If Glaskov hadn't been injured, would Charles Martin still have won? Who knows? We'll never know. It's an open question. But if you look at his resume outside of the Glaskov fight, he's beaten nobody. He's got wins over Kirsten, Manswell, uh, who else here? Joey DeWaco, Tom Dallas. I mean, a bunch of fringe contenders, journeymen, etc. Rafael Zambano Love. So the guy's beaten nobody of note. The Glasgow fight he won because Glasgow was injured and we don't know how that would have turned out. And obviously, he was knocked out in two rounds by Joshua. His most recent fight was against Adam Kaunaki last year. And to be fair, he put up a spirited effort but lost a unanimous decision. So certainly at this point, we have to say that Charles Martin was a weak heavyweight champion. No question about it. But there are a bunch of people running around online claiming that Charles Martin is the worst heavyweight champion in history. In fact, I've seen a couple of people claim that Charles Martin is the worst world champion in the history of boxing at any weight. Now, both of these claims are completely ridiculous. And let's think about it logically. In order for you to say that Charles Martin was, let's say, the worst heavyweight champion in history, you would have to have knowledge of and know all of the heavyweight champions that have ever existed in history. The reality is 99.9% .9 of boxing fans don't even know a quarter of the heavyweight champions that have existed in history. Much less all of them. And not only would you have to know all of the heavyweight champions that have existed from all the different sanctioning bodies in history, you'd also have to know who they fought. You'd have to have knowledge of their opponents to be able to assess how good they were in the context of the time. So unless you're going to come up in my comment section and barefaced lie and act as though, yes, you do know all the world heavyweight champions in history, you have watched them all, and you do know their opponents, that you're some kind of encyclopedic boxing historian, unless you're going to come up in my comment section and lie like that, then you better sit yourself down, right? <laughs> Slap Tyson Fury's you-know-what out your mouth, and start to employ some common sense. Because that's what this is all about. It's just a bunch of fanatics running around trying to discredit one of the heavyweight champions. That's all this is about. The reality is, and, and you know, it's people who don't know anything about boxing and don't have any logic in their mind. The reality is, yes, Charles Martin was a poor heavyweight champion. But there have been many poor heavyweight champions throughout the, the course of boxing history. And I'm going to show you some of the weaker heavyweight champions in history. I'll show you their box wrecks and I'll talk a little bit about their careers because I've seen most of them fight, if not all of them. And I know many of the opponents that they fought. Okay, so school's in session. <laughs> For those of you who don't know that much about the weaker heavyweight champions in history. For those of you running around saying Charles Martin's definitely the worst ever. I mean, <laughs> never mind saying he's the worst heavyweight champion in history the people running around saying he's the worst world champion of any weight in the history of boxing i mean what brand of crack are you smoking do you know all the world champions that have ever existed in every weight in history i don't <laughs> and i'm damn sure i damn sure know that you don't so yeah i'm going to show you some of the weaker heavyweight champions in history now to be fair to charles martin his career ain't over yet he might pull out a decent win at some point, or maybe he won't. Maybe he'll, you know, fade away into obscurity and start making those weird YouTube videos again where he appears to be on something. <laughs> we'll have to wait and find out. Uh, his career might turn up some surprises as some heavyweight champions in history's career 
or some heavyweights in history's careers have turned up. For example, Oliver McCall. Most of you have heard of Oliver McCall's name or seen him fight. Early in McCall's career, he was considered a journeyman. I mean, he lost his second professional fight on points to a guy called Joey Christ John. Put together a string of wins, lost to Michael Hunter. And yes, that is the dad of the current heavyweight contender, Michael Hunter. Lost to Buster Douglas, who himself at the time was considered, you know, a fringe contender. Lost to all in Norris, who was a good cruiserweight during his time, but didn't do much at heavyweight. Lost to Tony Tucker. By the time Oliver McCall fought Lennox Lewis, he was openly referred to as a journeyman by many people within the boxing press. Yeah, that's how Oliver McCall was referred to by many people when he fought Lewis, a journeyman. And it was a big surprise, a big shock when he knocked Lennox Lewis out. He did have a couple wins against Francesco Damiani, who was a WBO heavyweight champion at one point in his career. And I'll get on to Damiani a little bit later on. Uh, that was one of McCall's better wins before the Lewis fight. But, you know, the WBO was very lightly regarded at that point in history. So, and, and Damiani wasn't a very good fighter as a professional. He did okay as an amateur, but as a pro, he was pretty poor. He had a win over Jesse Ferguson, who had already lost five times by then. He did take the unbeaten record of Bruce Selden. Bruce Selden is another person I'm going to be talking about later on in this video because Bruce Selden has to be up there as one of the weakest heavyweight champions in history. For those of you who are not familiar with Bruce Selden, he was the guy that was knocked out in one round by Mike Tyson. And most people feel that he never really got hit properly the first time he went down. Like Mike Tyson threw a right hand which skimmed the top of Selden's head. Selden went down as if he'd been shot and was acting in terms of how uh, how discombobulated he was. He got up off the second knockdown, which was from a left hook, and he went into the corner, and the referee said, are you okay? And Selden shook his head, and then his knees wobbled. I mean, to me, that was a piece of acting, because Selden was just looking to get out of there as quickly as possible without taking any serious punishment. Selden has got to be up there as one of the weakest heavyweight champions. You know, don't, no disrespect to the guy, but I'm just being real. Even Buster Douglas, you know, outside of the Mike Tyson fight, what did Buster Douglas ever do his whole career? You know, he was referred to as a journeyman going into the Tyson fight. But anyway, I'll get onto all of that later. The point I'm making is fighters like McCall were written off early on in their careers, but they did manage to have at least one big moment, you know, Lewis. Uh, the Lennox Lewis fight, obviously, and after the Lewis fight, he did beat people like Henry Akinwandi, another one of the weakest heavyweight champions in history. Uh, Sinan Samuel Sam, who was a European level fighter. I mean, you know, you guys know Oliver McCall, you should do. So, yeah, will Charles Martin have an Indian summer in his career? Will he turn out to be someone that pulls off a couple of upsets? Maybe not. But who knows? Let's wait and find out. Maybe he'll turn out to be like uh, a Leon Spinks kind of character without the one upset win. Because Leon Spinks, again, one of the weakest heavyweight champions in history, other than beating Ali, he did absolutely nothing other than just get his, <laughs> his face punched in by everybody. <laughs> again, no disrespect. So anyway, let's move on from Charles Martin and let's talk about some of the weaker heavyweight champions in history. I've mentioned McCall. Don't need to go over him again. Henry Akinwandi, I briefly mentioned. Uh, off the top of my head, who did Henry Akinwandi beat? He beat Scott Welch, who was a British level fighter. He beat <sighs> Jeremy Williams, who was kind of a fringe contender at heavyweight. He beat, mm, what was that Russian guy called? He smashed his face up on the undercard of Tyson Holyfield 1. Alexander Zolkin, he beat him. Uh... Let me see who else he beat. He got knocked out by Oliver McCall, obviously. Let me see who he actually beat. Oh, Peter McNeely <laughs> was one of the people that he beat. Um, where are we at? And yeah, he, the, the Jeremy Williams win was 
for the vacant WBO heavyweight title. That's when he won the heavyweight title. Okay, he beat an ancient Tony Tucker. Um, Jimmy Funder was a really fringe contender. Uh, okay, the draw of Axel Schultz. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, so yeah, Henry Akinwandi never really did anything. <laughs> he, he beat a fringe contender in uh, Jeremy Williams for a vacant belt. And then, you know, well, later on in his career, knocked out by Oliver McCall. But what he's most remembered for, Henry Akinwandi, was quitting against Lennox Lewis. And that's a fairly famous fight for all the wrong reasons in Lewis's career because Henry Akinwande just held and held and held and held and held and his corner was screaming at him like, get out there and fight, what the hell are you doing? But he just continued to hold, continued to hold and he was determined to get disqualified against Lennox Lewis and that's exactly what happened. There was a moment in the fight, to be fair to him, where he landed a right hand on top of Lewis's head and Lewis's glove appeared to touch the canvas, but it was kind of a combination of Lewis, of landing a right hand on top of Lewis's head and also pushing Lewis down at the same time. So, you know, some people consider it a knockdown, others don't. But other than that brief moment, you know, which Lewis recovered very quickly from, Henry Akinwande was really having no success and he was just holding on for dear life and appeared to want to get disqualified. So Henry Akinwande has absolutely got to be up there as one of the weakest heavyweight champions in history. Really no notable wins, uh, beat a, a fringe contender in Jeremy Williams for the title and did nothing else. <laughs> so yeah, Henry akinwandi has got to be considered. Then you got Michael Bent. Now Michael Bent was actually a very good amateur. Um, maybe not so much internationally, but certainly domestically in the US, he was a pretty good amateur. He was one of America's top amateurs. But he's one of these amateurs who stayed amateur for too long, was in too many gym wars, and was actually damaged goods by the time he turned professional. Now, he didn't actually have many pro fights, as you can see. He was 11-2, and two, two losses by knockout. He lost his pro debut by first round KO, Michael Bent. All right? Put together a bunch of wins against journeyman. And then he was brought in against Tommy Morrison as a tune-up for Morrison. Morrison was uh, set to face Lennox Lewis in a WBO, WBC world heavyweight title unification. So he took on Michael Bent as a tune-up. Michael Bent was actually under pressure and hurt on the ropes, but he came out with a big right hand, dropped Morrison and actually took Morrison out in the first. Uh, Morrison was down three times in that fight. Uh, but then he defended against Herbie Hyde and he got smashed to pieces by Herbie Hyde. You know, lost just about every round, got smashed to pieces and never fought again after that. I think he did actually have some kind of issue with his brain or there was some kind of medical problem that prevented him from carrying on fighting. And I remember the, the build up to the Herbie Hyde fight. They actually got into uh, a fight at one of the press events <laughs> they were both outside in the rain they got into a fight and Hyde actually dropped Michael Bent and ripped his suit in their little scuffle that they had and Hyde was like crying bizarrely <laughs> after they had the little scuffle Hyde was crying weird uh, and I'll get on to Herbie Hyde as well as one of the weaker heavyweight champions in history but Michael Bent has got to be up there again no disrespect to the guy but if you look at what he actually did you know nice little win over Tommy Morrison who wasn't one of the stronger heavyweight champions in history let's be real uh, but yeah, Michael Ben definitely has to be a candidate as one of the weakest heavyweight champions of all time. Moving on to this man here, Bruce Seldon, who I mentioned briefly before. Bruce Seldon, off the top of my head, beat an ancient Tony Tucker. Uh, but he, Seldon's most notable fights were being knocked out in the first round by Riddick Bow. Uh, being knocked out in the first round by Mike Tyson <laughs> and also losing to Oliver McCall. <laughs> he even lost to Tony Tubbs, as you can see there. An ancient Tony Tubbs at that point. There's the back-to-back -back losses to Riddick Bowen McCall. 
You see, and these were before he won a version of the heavyweight title, losing to McCall and Riddick Bowe. You know, the funny thing about Bruce Seldon is that he was very athletically gifted. If you were to see Bruce Seldon beating up some journeymen, you might be pretty impressed because he was fast and he could move and, you know, very explosive. But he had a few issues. One, his punch resistance was really poor, even though he had this big neck, you know, like a, like a bull he appeared to not be able to take a shot. And on top of that, he appeared to suffer from some kind of anxiety disorder, similar to Andrew Galotta. Uh, not, maybe not as severe as Galotta, but he seemed, he seemed to suffer from anxiety. I remember reading an interview where he was talking about the Riddick Bowl fight and he said he basically suffered an anxiety attack in that Riddick Bowl fight. He just looked across the ring and he saw this huge guy and he panicked. So when a guy is telling you that he suffered an anxiety attack, <laughs> in one of his fights, that's not a good sign. So yeah, he didn't have the greatest punch resistance. His confidence wasn't really there. And I think he also suffered an anxiety attack in the Mike Tyson fight. That's what it looked like to me. Uh, yeah, co was, couldn't really take much of a shot. Uh, suffered with anxiety, so a, a confidence problem. And... He was a relatively small heavyweight. I mean, I guess at the time you had people like Holyfield and, and, and what have you, but he certainly wasn't the size of a Riddick Bowl, a Lennox Lewis, etc. And those were two of the top heavyweights at the time, or Andrew Galotta. So he had a few different issues, but he definitely has to be considered one of the weakest heavyweight champions in history. And certainly his performance against Mike Tyson will go down in infamy for being pathetic, really. Again, no disrespect, but that was a head shaker <laughs> to where he performed against Mike Tyson. And that's when he was champion. He won his uh, title, the vacant WBA heavyweight title against an ancient Tony Tucker at the time. Uh, one thing I, I do have to say about uh, Bruce Eldon, apart from being athletically gifted, is that he developed a very nice jab by this point in his career against Tony Tucker. And he really busted Tony Tucker's face up. You see, well, there you see the the, the fight was stopped due to Tucker's swelling eyes. He busted Tucker's face up with that jab. All right. A very old Tony Tucker. To be fair, Tucker had only had two losses to Mike Tyson and Lennox Lewis, but he suffered, you know, for a long time with alcoholism and stuff like that. And he was an old guy at the time. I think he must have been about 40 years old at the time when he fought um, Bruce Seldon. Must have been around then. Because when he fought Lewis, he was about, what, 36 or something, 37? So by the time he fought Tucker, he must have been in his late 30s, early 40s. Uh, sorry, by the time Tucker fought Seldon, he must have been in his late 30s, early 40s. Uh, but yeah, Bruce Seldon has to be considered one of the weakest heavyweight champions of all time. Then we move on to Mike Weaver. Now, Mike Weaver was known for being a very big puncher, having a devastating left hook, and he did, you know, knock some fairly decent fighters out with that left hook. But at the same time, Mike Weaver, similar to Oliver McCall, in fact, probably a more extreme example than McCall, w appeared to be going nowhere early on in his career. Have a look at his resume here. Lost his first two fights. I mean, look, lost three out of his first four fights. Was knocked out several times. Knocked out by Howard Smith. Knocked out by Larry Fraser. Knocked out by Dwayne Bobick. Dwayne Bobick was a, a decent-ish fighter at the time, to be fair. I put together a few wins here, lost to Stan Ward, lost to Leroy Jones. I mean, this is all before Hercules, as they used to call him, Mike Weaver, was heavyweight champion. Before he held a version of a heavyweight title, he had all these losses. <laughs> he managed to put a few wins together and challenge Larry Holmes, was knocked out by Holmes. That was one of his biggest wins against John Tate. Right now, he was behind in that fight. It was the 15th round, and he came out with one left hook and knocked John Tate out cold. John Tate landed on his face, um, knocked out Jerry Coltsy, another one of the weaker heavyweight champions in history. We got sparked out in one round by Michael Dokes. Michael Dokes himself wasn't one of the stronger heavyweight champions ever. Dokes was talented, though, you know, fast hands, good combination puncher, but regularly out of shape but when Dokes was on it he was actually pretty useful to be fair he, he was talented but you know there's all it's all well and good having talent 
But if you can't keep yourself in shape, if you can't lay off certain substances, then that talent is going to go to waste. And that was the case with Michael Dokes. But yeah, sparked out by Dokes. I mean, well, I don't need to go through every single loss, <laughs> right? Pinkle and Thomas and Razor. I don't need to go through every single loss of Mike Weaver's career. But you can see from all the red there that the guy had plenty of faults as a fighter. And he appeared certainly for much of his career to be going absolutely nowhere. And then he sprung an upset in the 15th round against John Tate. All right. A guy, how many losses had he had by the time he fought John Tate? Let's have a look at John Tate's resume a second so we can find Mike Weaver's. Okay. So going into the John Tate fight, Mike Weaver had nine losses. Mike Weaver, as big a puncher as he was, certainly has to be in the running for one of, if not the weakest heavyweight champion in history. But there are others. John Tate himself, okay, only ever lost three fights, two by KO. But who did John Tate ever beat? <laughs> no callers. That guy actually fought Lennox Lewis. I think he's from Birmingham, no callers. Actually beating John Tate in one of Tate's, in, in the latter heart, uh, part of John Tate's career. No callers, I'm sure he's from Birmingham, isn't he? No callers. Uh, yeah, lost to Trevor Burbick. Lost to Mike Weaver, obviously talked about that. Had a win over Jerry Coltsy, the South African. Dwayne Bobic was a half-decent win. Um, Bernardo Mercado, that guy actually knocked out Trevor Burbick in the first round. This was before Trevor Bur Burbick was knocked out by Tyson. He was knocked out by Bernardo Mercado in one round. Uh, other than Nels, I mean, again, there's nobody great on John Tate's resume at all. <laughs> yeah, that, and he, this guy was a heavyweight champion. Let me see here. He won... The vacant belt, as many of the you know, world champions in history have won vacant belts. He won a vacant belt against Jerry Coetzee and really did nothing else. You know, Lost it straight away against Mike Weaver. <laughs> Knocked out by Trevor Burbick. But John Tate definitely has to be considered one of the weakest heavyweight champions in history. He literally beat nobody. Then we move on to Francois Bolta. Now, Francois Bolta... It's, it's a little unclear whether people are going to count him as a former heavyweight champion because he did hold a version of the heavyweight title, but he lost it shortly after the fight, or shortly after he won it because he tested positive for steroids. Okay, and that was when he won a vacant belt against Axel Schultz. See if we can pull up the fight here. Where are we at? Yeah, there it is. Vacant IBF world heavyweight title. Initially... It was a split decision win for Francois Bolta, but it was overturned and changed into a no contest after he tested positive for steroids. Now, Francois Bolta was a tough guy, had a lot of heart, but <laughs> every time he stepped up, he got the absolute crap beat out of him just about every time. Prior to beating Axel Schultz, I mean, it's not a who's who of the heavyweight division that he fought prior to his heavyweight title fight. It's a who's he? Who was he fighting? I mean, do you know any of these people? <laughs> he did beat Michael Hunter, to be fair. Michael Hunter was a decent fringe contender. Um, but Michael Hunter was an on-off fighter, you know. Ginger Shabalala. Ginger Shabalala was a relative of Courage Shabalala, who went on to be a fringe contender himself, Kurid Shabalala. And Kurid Shabalala is actually the cousin of Sugar Boy Malinga, Tulani Malinga, who was the middleweight and super middleweight contender and champion. Remember, Sugar Boy Malinga beat Nigel Ben. Uh, that was, was it one or two fights after Ben beat McClellan? He fought Sugar Boy Malinga again and uh, yeah, lost that fight. Sugar Boy Malinga also beat Robin Reed. He fought Roy Jones. He fought Chris Eubank. He, you know, yeah, did a lot. So anyway, back to Mr. Francois Bolta. What did he, who did he beat in his career? Prior to uh, fighting for the title, and, and he won it against Axel Schultz. <laughs> 
Axel Schultz, people, a European level fighter who, I mean, Axel Schultz's best performance was probably against George Foreman. And to be fair, a lot of people felt like he beat George Foreman. Probably most neutral observers felt like he beat George Foreman, but this was an ancient Foreman, you know, and Schultz did what he did. But yeah, Schultz was no great shakes and a steroided up Bofer beat him on points to become, you know, IBF heavyweight champion at the time. He lost it in his next fight to Michael Mora. That was on the undercard of Tyson Holyfield 1. And that was one of the worst beatings I have ever seen in a heavyweight title fight was Michael Mora versus Francois Bolta. That was horrific. And in fact, there were two fights on this particular night, November 9th, 1996, which were brutal. And one of them was Michael Mora versus uh, Francois Bolta. And the other one, which I briefly talked about earlier, was Henry Akin one day versus Alexander Zolkin. Today, certainly if the, those fights took, in, uh, took place in the UK, they would have been stopped way, way earlier. Zolkin's face was an absolute mess against Henry Akinwandi. Did I say Akinwandi against Zolkin? I hope I did. But yeah, Henry Akinwandi versus Zolkin. Zolkin's face was an absolute mess. And that fight should have, should have really been stopped earlier. And Michael Mora just beat the absolute crap out of Francois Bolter. There was a couple of times when Bolter maybe uh, buzzed Mora slightly with a couple shots. But for the most part, it was just Francois Bolter taking the mother of all beatings. And it's the kind of fight that you really worried for a fighter's health and safety in. Because he took such a terrible beating in that fight. It should have been stopped way earlier than it was. It ended up being stopped in the 12th. Any of you who haven't seen that, go and watch it, <laughs> right? <laughs> Certainly from, you know, what, the midway stage on, it was like Michael Mora hitting a heavy bag. That's what it was. Uh, anyway, Francois Bolta came back from that, put together a few wins against Journeyman, <laughs> as you do. Then was knocked out by Mike Tyson in five. Uh, this was Mike Tyson after he came back for his, from his ban for biting Holyfield's ear. Uh, and to be fair to Bolta, he was actually winning the fight. It was a very rusty Tyson, but Bolta was winning the fight, but he ended up getting knocked out by one straight right hand from Tyson. He had a draw against Shannon Briggs. Fight after that. Knocked out by Lewis in two rounds. Couple fights later, knocked out by Vladimir Klitschko, draw with Clifford Etienne. You know, Etienne's an interesting character. That guy was an ex-con who had been in prison, served a long time in prison for armed robbery. He came out of prison. I think he actually learned to box in prison. And then he came out of prison, turned professional, and had a, a run as a fringe contender, got knocked out a few times, then went back in prison for armed robbery again. <laughs> and I think Clifford Etienne is still in prison today. Last I checked. Sad story. Um, okay, win over Bob Mirovich. Timo Hoffman. Lost to Holyfield, TKO. And that was a really old Holyfield with 10 losses. And he lost that fight. Lost to Michael Grant. Lost the tack. I mean, okay, this is in more recent times. So there you go. Francois Bolter also has to be in the running for weakest heavyweight champion in history. Because well, he really beat nobody. <laughs> nobody of note. And uh, was battered every time he stepped up. Leon Spinks. Now, Leon Spinks is famous for beating Muhammad Ali. And it was one of the biggest upsets in heavyweight history when he beat Muhammad Ali. Because he only had, what was it, six fights or seven fights when he fought Ali. And Ali was a you know, long reigning champion a two-time heavyweight champion going into the first fight. But the reality is Ali was grossly overweight. He hadn't trained for Leon Spinks because Spinks had no experience. Yes, he was an Olympian and all that kind of business, but Ali never thought that uh, uh, this inexperienced amateur could possibly trouble him. So Ali came into the fight grossly overweight and underestimated Leon Spinks. I mean, Spinks had a draw with Scott Ledoux in what was that is one two three four five six fight 
Scott Ledoux, Scott Ledoux. I always struggle with <laughs> French surnames. Forgive me. Uh, so, yeah, going into the Ali fight, a split decision win over 15 rounds. In the rematch, Ali completely scored him. It wasn't competitive, which showed you the level that Spinks was actually at. And this was an old Ali. I mean, look at Ali there, you know, far heavier than he normally would be. And they say he came into camp as well. In fact, Ali wasn't that heavy, to be fair, 224. But he looked terrible if you watch that fight. Ali's body looked hor <laughs> look horrible. It was only, what, three pounds lighter in the rematch. But Ali physically looked much better in the rematch. And they say that Ali came into camp grossly overweight for the Sphinx fight. That's what they say. And it, to me, it appeared to be evident in the performance because Ali performed terribly first time around. But second, in the second fight, Ali totally scored him. It wasn't even close. Now, from there on in, all Leon Spinks did was take an absolute battering of, of just about every world-class fighter he ever stepped in the ring with, other than his little 15 minutes of fame against Ali. A, a very old Ali, you know, this was 1978. He was nearly, nearly the 80s by the time uh, Ali fought Spinks. So this was Ali on his last legs. But, you know, fair, fair play to Spinks. He did pull off that upset win. But, you know, Ali reversed it in the rematch. Spinks was then knocked out in one round by Jerry Coltsy. <laughs> this, this, this just wiped out. Knocked out in three by Larry Holmes. But we know Larry Holmes was a great fighter. Carlos De Leon had him retire. Dwight Muhammad Kawi, the former cruiserweight. Oh, sorry, what well, this was for the cruiserweight title, my bad. Uh, knocked him out. I saw that fight, actually. I was watching, I was re-watching a lot of Dwight Muhammad Kawi fights a couple of months ago, and that is one of the fights that I re-watched. It was uh, uh, Kawi against Spinks. <sighs> knocked out by Rocky Sarakoski. I always mispronounce that name. Knocked out by Jose Robota. Most of you remember Jose Robota, the French contender who fought Mike Tyson, Frank Bruno, etc. Knocked out by Angelo, Angelo Massoni. I mean, on and on it goes. Leon Spinks, other than the upset win over Muhammad Ali, he did nothing in his career. Nothing. Leon Spinks was famous as well for having no teeth. <laughs> Spinks had no front teeth. <laughs> and in fact, I swear his brother Michael also didn't have front teeth, but I don't think he was missing as many teeth as Leon was. Leon literally had no front teeth at all. <laughs> Even in the Ali fight. <laughs> he had like, I swear he put like fake teeth in or something, but at some point the gap got so big that, yeah, a lot of the time it, it, there wasn't even fake teeth to be able to cover that gap. <laughs> but yeah, you know, no disrespect to Leon Spinks, but we have to consider him to be one of the weakest heavyweight champions in history. You know, again, aside from that one shock win over Ali, he did nothing and got battered every time he stepped up. All right. Then there's this guy, Oleg Miskayev. Now, Miskayev was actually a decent amateur, originally from Kazakhstan, and he beat Vitaly Klitschko in the amateurs. And that's no mean feat. He actually stopped Klitschko. And Klitschko for many years disputed what Miskayev was saying. But there was an amateur coach who came out and confirmed what Miskayev was saying was true. And there was also the fact that Vitaly Klitschko had denied being knocked out in a kickboxing match against Pele Reed. Pele Reed had been saying this for years. Okay, Pele Reed was really a, an area level heavyweight out of the Ingle gym in the 1990s. Uh, but he was a good kickboxer before he turned over as a professional. And Pele Reed, when he was on, you know, the way up as somewhat of a prospect in the UK as a boxer, he was running around saying he knocked out Vitaly Klitschko as a kickboxer. So Vitaly Klitschko was denying this for years, but then footage came out, irrefutable footage, which shows Vitaly Klitschko getting knocked out cold by Pele Reed in a kickboxing match when Vitaly was like 17 or 18 or whatever it was. So it did actually happen. So that kind of lent, lent a bit of credence to what Oleg Maskaev was saying, because if Vitaly could lie about the Pele Reed fight, maybe he's also lying about the Maskaev fight. So Maskaev was constantly going on about this. 
But truth be told, Muskayev, he has to be a contender for one of the weakest heavyweight champions in history. But I wouldn't put him among the top contenders. He was knocked out by Oliver McCall. I remember that fight. Uh, knocked out by David Tua. That was when David Tua was unbeaten and on the ascendancy. Did have a win over Kurid Shabalala. I talked about Kurid Shabalala before. Marion Wilson was a, a trial horse at the time, but one of the, the trial horses who a lot of the contenders were fighting. Jeff Wooden, I remember him too. So yeah, he was really, he'd really beaten nobody <laughs> up until this point. Uh, it had a couple of bad losses, knockout losses. Um, Shabalala might have been the best win that he had up, you know, up until he fought Hasim Ratman. Shabalala might have been the best win. I look back here. Yeah, it probably was. Shabalala wasn't any great shakes himself. He was a, a South African heavyweight who could punch really hard and he was in the Duva camp, but didn't have much of a chin, didn't have much heart. So it was ironic that he was called Courage, <laughs> to be fair. Uh, and they did put that in. I got that from the Ring magazine or one of the boxing publications, but that's what they... Yeah, they, they, were, they were quite mean, the boxing publications back in the days, you know, the way they used to ridicule fighters for getting knocked out and stuff like that. And I remember them quibbing about how a man called Courage appears to have no courage. But anyway, moving on from that, he eventually took on Hassim Ratman. Now, Hassim Ratman was a contender at the time, but Ratman had really beat you know, nobody of any real note himself at that time. Okay. I know Ratman beat Corey Sanders and, and, and people like that when you look back at his career. But at the time, in the context of the time, Ratman was relatively unproven. Ratman had also beat, I think, an ancient Trevor Burbick on the way up and stuff like that. But Muscayab's win over Ratman was seen as two unproven contenders, you know, two unproven wannabes really fighting each other. And well, we know what happened in the fight. <laughs> Muskayev knocked Hassim Ratman out of the ring. <laughs> For those who haven't seen it. And, and weirdly enough, Muskayev and Ratman fought twice. And both times, Hassim Ratman was knocked out of the ring. <laughs> it's the strangest thing. Man got knocked out of the ring both times. <laughs> But anyway, uh, the Ratman win was a decent win for Muskayev in retrospect. At the time, it didn't seem that significant. But when you take into account the fact that Ratman went on to knock out Lennox Lewis, it looks better in that context. You understand? This is why we have to wait and see how bad Charles Martin is or how bad any of these fighters or good any of these fighters are. We have to wait and see till their careers are done before we can make a real proper assessment. You see, with people like Maskayev, we have the luxury of looking back on his career and seeing everything in retrospect. And it's at that point that you can more accurately judge a fighter's career and how good they were or how good they weren't. Anyway, he went on to get knocked out by Kirk Johnson. And, you know, Maskayev was a very stiff fighter, not the biggest heavyweight you've seen, but fairly physically strong. He had decent power, but he was stiff and he was chinny. And that is in evidence by the amount of times he was dropped and knocked out in his career. Knocked out by Lance Whitaker as well. This Corey Saunders is not to be mistaken with the South African Corey Saunders. This is uh, one of Michael, uh, sorry, Michael, he is called Michael, but one of Mike Tyson's sparring partners. After Tyson came out of prison in uh, 95, Corey Saunders was one of Tyson's main sparring partners. A very big guy, very fat guy, as you can see there, 312 pounds. And this is the guy who knocked out Muskayev on this particular occasion, right? Not to be mistaken with the South African Southpaw Corey Saunders. Uh, okay, winner over Julius Francis. Uh, Sinan, Sinan Samuel Sam in a WBC heavyweight title eliminator. Sinan Samuel Sam was a Turkish uh, heavyweight based in Germany who was the second man from memory to defeat Danny Williams because Danny Williams' first loss was to Julius Francis and then he lost to Sinan Samuel Sam in a European title fight and that was shocking at the time because I don't think Danny Williams had been down as a pro up until that point and a lot of people in Britain favoured him to beat Samuel Sam but he went over there and he just got smashed to pieces 
<laughs> but anyway, Maskaev's got a win over him. Then, of course, the rematch with Ratman, where, again, Ratman was not out of the ring. <laughs> it wasn't as bad as the first fight in terms of, you know, him going out of the ring. But, yeah. In fact, was he? What, what, what did the fight finish with Ratman out of the ring? It's been such a long time since I saw that rematch. But at some point, he went out of the ring. At some point, his head went through the ropes <laughs> and stuff like that. Uh, but I think the was the fight waved off. It was a TKO. Maybe the fight was waved off. Been a long time since I saw that. Then he. Okay, so eliminator. Okay, the Ratman fight was for the WBC heavyweight title. So, I see, I always forget how he actually got the heavyweight title in the first place. So, I guess he was given the heavyweight title at some point. Because the Ratman fight was for the WBC. And prior to that, he fought a WBC eliminator. I see, I'm, I'm going way back in history. So, at some point... Maskaev was given the WBC heavyweight title. So he didn't win it in the ring because this was not for a vacant belt. Defended against Ratman, beat him. Defended against Okolo, Okello Peter. I believe that's a relative of Sam Peter. Then he actually fought Sam Peter himself, lost the fight. And then we move on to Sam Peter, who also is one of the weakest heavyweight champions in history. But who have we got next? Nikolai Valoev, of course. Nikolai Valoev was seen by a lot of people as kind of like a modern version of Primo Carnera. Primo Carnera is somebody I'm going to talk about as well. But Carnera was controlled by the Italian-American mafia. And he was one of the prototypical hype jobs in boxing. One of the prototypical protected fighters, literally protected by the mob and exploited by the mob, actually. If you've read about Primo Carnera, his story is quite sad you know, the way he was a puppet for the Italian mob and the way he was kept away from a lot of legitimate heavyweights for much of his career. And he was eventually exposed. So Primo Carnera is also up there as one of the weakest heavyweight champions in history, but so is Nikolai Valoev, the modern incarnation of Carnera. The tallest heavyweight champion ever at six feet tall. Oh, sorry, six feet, seven feet tall. Excuse me, people. It is late here. <laughs> I'm actually recording this at about 4 a.m. <laughs> believe it or not, you probably don't believe me. Let me turn on my clock. That's even worse. 4.37 a.m. it is right now. All right. So, yeah, Nikolai Valoev. Now, some of you may not have watched his early fights, uh, but there's one early fight. See, he was literally fighting nobody in the early years. And he was promoted briefly early in his career. I think it was by Frank Maloney, wasn't he? That's why he fought in the UK these times. Because Frank Maloney, was it Frank Maloney or Hearn or Warren? One of the British promoters was promoting him early on in his career. I forget which one it was. I, I want to say it's Maloney, but I'm not 100%. But anyway, he was fighting a bunch of absolute nobodies and people you've never heard of uh, through much of his career, as you can see. Uh, look at, look, I mean, look how many fights he is in here, right? Was he 20 fights in here or something? And he's still fighting people 2-0, and 3-0. <laughs> it's crazy. Now, these are some names I recognize. Bob Mirovich, who was an Australian-based Eastern European heavyweight. Managed to get a UD over him. Otis Teasdale. These are journeymen I, whose names I recognize. Now, this is the fight I was looking for. Marcello Dominguez is a former cruiserweight champion five foot nine inches tall and he was a fairly decent cruiserweight to be fair Marcelo Dominguez now let's have a look at the Valoev fight all right let's see if we can find a Valoev fight there Valoev was 35 and 0 by the time he fought Marcelo Dominguez now if you watch this fight Valoev against Dominguez it is one of the strangest things you've ever seen because you've got a grossly overweight five foot nine inch former cruiserweight who just looks like a fat guy they dragged out of a pub against this 323 pound seven feet tall Russian Nikolai Valoev. It is one of the strangest sights you'll ever see. All right. An eight rounder. Nikolai Valoev won the fight on the cards. But if you actually go and watch that fight, go and watch it. 
Don't just see me talk about it. Go and watch. It's on YouTube. Go and watch Nikolai Valuev versus Marcelo Dominguez. Now, Dominguez, again, was a former cruiserweight champion. He did have some skill, but the guy was like 40 pounds overweight. <laughs> he was on the tail end of his career. And I'm telling you now, he gave Nikolai Valuev the business. These scorecards are absurd. Go and watch it for yourself and see. He gave Nikolai Valuev the business. He was hitting him with right hand after right hand after right hand. God only knows how a, a, a fat old, you know, 40 pounds overweight cruiserweight who's only 5'9 is able to connect on such a regular basis against a man who's 7 feet tall. <laughs> that shows you how poor Nikolai Velov actually was. And this was his 35th fight. Jeez, people. Uh, remarkable that he was so bad 35 fights in. Anyway, he went on to fight uh, Paulo Vidos. Paulo Vidos, he's the guy that Audie Harrison fought in the Olympics, isn't he? Vidos. And he bust up Vidos' nose. I'm pretty sure it was Vidos. So he had a win over Vidos there. Gerald Nobles. Attila, Attila Levin. Wasn't Levin Swedish? Pretty sure this is a Swedish heavyweight. I remember it, I remember watching him on Eurosport. <laughs> Attila Levin. Clifford Etienne. I already spoke about him. Uh, Larry Donald, who at the time was on the tail end of his career as well. You see, he had three losses, three draws, Larry Donald at the time. Very strange man, Larry Donald. He, he literally felt like he was the reincarnation of Muhammad Ali. <laughs> Very odd. Then he had the, the quote unquote majority decision win over John Ruiz for the uh, WBA heavyweight title. Now, that was a very contentious win. I mean, John Ruiz to this day would probably tell you that Nikolai Valuev never beat him. So that was a contentious win, but he did get a win over John Ruiz at the time. Ruiz had five losses and a draw. Be Owen Beck. Again, these are fringe contenders. Monty Barra. I remember his little title reign. Um, then he lost to Ruslan Chigaev. Majority, but really he it should have been unanimous as far as I'm concerned. He lost to Ruslan Chigaev. Uh, came back. Fought John Ruiz again. And John Ruiz and his team were furious. When Valoev got this <laughs> this decision, I think it was after this fight when John Ruiz's coach, uh, Norman Stone, who was one of the most hilarious boxing coaches you'll ever see because he had a serious anger problem. <laughs> uh, Stoney, they call him. It was after this fight, I think, not the first one, that Stoney went absolutely crazy in the ring <laughs> and got into some kind of altercation with Valoev's people. <laughs> Oh, uh, gosh, I, I swear it was after the rematch, not the, the first fight. But then Valoev fought Holyfield, who was absolutely old as dirt at the time. Nine losses, two draws, Holyfield at this time. And most people felt like Holyfield actually beat Valoev. Can you imagine Holyfield, who, how old was he? In his 40s, nearly 50? Fought Valoev, and most people think the ancient Holyfield beat Valoev. That is how poor Valoev was as a heavyweight champion and obviously lost to David Hay in his final fight. So yeah, Valoev has to be considered one of the weakest heavyweight champions in history. No question. Then we move on to James Buster Douglas. Now again, Buster Douglas is most famous for his win over Mike Tyson. He was a 42 to 1 underdog. And you need to think about why he was a 42 to 1 underdog. Because Buster Douglas was widely regarded by the press at the time. Even Larry Merchant mentioned it uh, in the run-up to the Tyson fight. He was referred to as a journeyman. Why was he referred to as a journeyman? Well, because he was knocked out by David Bay. Now, David Bay was making his pro debut. Okay, this was Buster Douglas's fifth fight. David Bay, who was a fringe contender in the 80s, was making his pro debut and he knocked out Buster Douglas. Okay, Douglas went on to have a draw with Stefan Tangstad. A few fights later, he was knocked out by Mike White. He had a majority draw with Jesse Ferguson. And then when he finally, he did have a win over Greg Page, but Greg Page was, I mean, he, he was a half decent fighter on his day, but he had problems as so many fighters did 
in the 80s with certain substances and it really <laughs> robbed him of any talent that he actually may have had otherwise. But yeah, that was a half decent win for him over Greg Page. Uh, who else? You know, David J. Cole. Then he fought Tony Tucker for the vacant IBF title. Now, I've spoken about why this fight happened. This fight happened because Michael Spinks gave up his IBF title. This uh, was supposed to be Michael Spinks versus Tony Tucker. All right, but Tucker, uh, the Spinks gave up his IBF title and Tucker fought Douglas for it instead. And Douglas was actually doing okay in the fight. And Douglas was someone who did have physical talent, but the two things which were always in question and the two things which always appeared to let him down were his chin and his heart. All right, particularly his heart. It was openly criticized about not having heart. Even his own dad, after the Tucker loss, because his own dad used to train him, his own dad was very spirited, uh, light heavyweight contender decades earlier. And, you know, he was known for having a lot of heart. His own dad basically washed his hands of him, not as a, as a human being, but as a fighter. His own dad gave up and said, you know what, I can't do it no more. He just doesn't have the heart. It was frustrating for his dad. So... Yeah, that was the first time he stepped up to world level, Buster Douglas, and he'd already lost a bunch of times prior, and he was stopped by Tony Tucker. But, you know, I, I think it was a decent effort, but he just gassed out, really, and didn't really have the tenacity to fight through it. So he came back, he strung some wins together. He did beat Oliver McCall, but again, Oliver McCall at the time was not, was a lightly regarded fighter. He was Mike Tyson's sparring partner. He'd really done nothing at the time. Didn't have much of an amateur career. Was 14 and 2 going into it. So in retrospect, Oliver McCall is one of Douglas's better wins. But at the time, it was, you know, nobody was really <laughs> over the moon or saying anything about Douglas beating McCall. People were like, who's McCall? <laughs> then there was the Mike Tyson shocker. All right, 42 to 1 underdog, 11th of February, 1990, Tokyo, Japan, biggest upset in heavyweight boxing history. Uh, but outside of that, Douglas really didn't do anything, you know, beat a young, inexperienced Oliver McCall on points. Uh, what else did he do? You know, the Tyson win outside of that. He got knocked out by Holyfield in his very next fight. Then he, he, you know, he ended up, spe uh, Buster Douglas was somebody who always struggled with his weight. And after the Holyfield loss, he went into a depression and he basically ate himself into a diabetic coma, <laughs> right? A really messed up situation. Ate himself into a diabetic coma, nearly died but eventually got himself together and made a comeback. And I remember when he made his comeback in the mid-90s, came back against Tony La Rosa, and eventually his comeback streak, right, he put together a streak against all these journeymen, was ended by Lou Savarese, of all people. Lou Savarese, the very guy who got knocked out in one round by Mike Tyson. Lou Savarese also fought an ancient George Foreman and, you know, a bunch of other people. Uh, but Lou Savarese ended Buster Douglas's uh, streak on his comeback, you know, dropped him several times. And again, Buster Douglas's lack of punch resistance showed up again in that fight. Finished his career with a couple of wins over journeyman. So all things considered, again, similar to Leon Spinks, if you take that one shock victory out of the equation against Mike Tyson, and you look at his career in retrospect, he really beat nobody and did nothing. And again, Fighters who are still active today, they might have a shock victory in them at some point. You don't know. I'm not predicting that Charles Martin will. Not at all. But you never know until their careers are done. Because I can assure you, many of the fighters I've already spoken about, and many of the fighters I'm going to speak about, were totally written off. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't have been more written off than Douglas was against Tyson. 42 to 1 underdog. Nobody gave him a prayer. Everybody thought he was just a lamb to the slaughter. Tyson had fought much better people than this. Douglas has got no heart. He's, you know, a journeyman and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So we have to wait and see.
But anyway, let's move on. Francesco Damiani. I believe Damiani was the first WBO heavyweight champion. I might be wrong. There might have been someone before him, but he was one of the earliest WBO heavyweight champions anyway. Now, Damiani was actually a decent amateur, but as a professional, he really didn't do anything. (laughs) You know, he really just got battered by all the half-decent fighters he stepped up and fought from Italy. So let's have a look at it. He beat Tyrell Biggs, all right? And he was the second man to beat Biggs after Mike Tyson beat him. Uh, But Biggs, big time problem with cocaine and drinking, I believe. Even prior to the Tyson fight, Tyrell Biggs had serious substance abuse problems, which is why he was rushed into the Tyson fight by his team, the Duvers. They rushed him into that fight because they knew his uh, drug habit was going to get him beat by somebody else. So they thought, you know what, we better cash him out against Tyson now before somebody else beats him because he was nearly beaten by David Bay prior to the Tyson fight. So yeah, he had substance abuse problems as many fighters did in the 80s. And, um, you know, really after the Tyson fight, Biggs was washed up. <laughs> I mean, Biggs might have been washed up before the Tyson fight because of the fact that he was, you know, a crackhead. No disrespect. Uh, even though he was unbeaten. So, yeah, went over Tyrell Biggs. And that's it. Knocked out by Ray Mercer. I remember that. Yeah, it even says it here. I remember that Ray Mercer knockout. Uh, Damiani's nose was just bleeding like a tap. (laughs) It's like somebody turned a tap on and his nose was just gushing blood uh, when he got stopped by Ray Mercer and was also stopped by Oliver McCall. And it's interesting, he was stopped by an uppercut from Ray Mercer. He was also stopped by an uppercut from McCall. A left uppercut, I I seem to remember in that fight. Uh, Did have a win over an ancient Greg Page with 10 losses. But that's it. So Francesco Damiani absolutely has got to be one of the front runners for weakest heavyweight champion of all time. Beat nobody, really did nothing. (laughs) You know, and to be fair, at the time, the WBO was a brand new organization and, you know, very lightly regarded. It wasn't really a universally recognized sanctioning body until (sighs) Lewis retired and the Klitschko's went on their run. And that's when it started getting more credibility. I mean, it was get, it was gradually getting more credibility towards the end of the nineties, early two thousands, but it never got universally recognized as a world heavyweight title by everybody until after Lewis had retired and the Klitschko's took it on to be fair. All right. To be completely fair, but be that as it may, when you look back in retrospect, the WBO is still counted as a sanctioned body in today's context. So, you know, I, I could definitely entertain the argument that Damiani wasn't really a heavyweight champion because the WBO wasn't recognized then. I can entertain that argument. Uh, but nonetheless, the record books are going to say he was. So if you count him as a heavyweight champion, then he has to be up there as one of the very weakest. All right, let's move on to this guy, Jerry Coltsy. Jerry Coltsy was a South African heavyweight. Uh, there was also another South African heavyweight who was around at the time called Pierre Coltsia. Jerry won a version of the heavyweight title. Pierre did not. So, yeah, let's have a look at Jerry Coates here. A notable win there over Leon Spinks, but we've already talked about Leon Spinks. Lost to John Tate. Lost to Mike Weaver. Lost to Ronaldo Snipes. Uh, Snipes fought Larry Holmes and you know a bunch of other people. Snipes was kind of a, a contender slash fringe contender who could bang a bit in his day, Ronaldo Snipes. But one of my, other than the Larry Holmes uh, fight, one of the... You know, one of my most um, vivid memories of Ronaldo Snipes was when he fought Jorge Luis Gonzalez. This was when Snipes was way past his best and Jorge Luis Gonzalez, the Cuban heavyweight, was on the way up. And he fought Gonzalez, I think it was on the undercard of Holyfield Bowl 2. And Gonzalez beat the absolute crap out of him. It's from Yonkers, New York, Ronaldo Snipes. Um, But yeah, lost to him. Beat Scott Ledeur. Draw with Pinkland Thomas. That might be his best result of his whole career. Coltsy. Or perhaps the... Actually, maybe it was the Dolks win. Yeah, maybe it was the Dolks win. 
Those are some decent wins, to be fair. Those are decent wins. Or, well, a draw and a decent win. Knocked out by Greg Page. Knocked out by Frank Bruno. Most British boxing fans of a certain age will remember the Frank Bruno uh, win. Bruno knocked him out cold. <laughs> that was ugly. <laughs> they had to hold Coltsy's head up, you know, off the the, the, the ring canvas at the, at the side because his, his head went underneath. And I think he was half resting on the table of one of, you know, of the journalists at ringside. He got knocked the hell out in that fight and finished his career incredibly getting knocked out by Iron Barkley at heavyweight. And for those of you who don't know Iron Barkley, this is a former middleweight champion, right? Jerry Coltsy was a fully fledged heavyweight. And he ended up his career getting knocked out by a former middleweight champion who was washed up himself at the time. That's pretty incredible. <laughs> pretty incredible. So yeah, Pierre Coetzee, sorry, Jerry Coetzee. You look at me getting it mixed up again. Jerry Coetzee has to be considered a contender for one of the weakest heavyweight champions of all time. Uh, the Michael Dokes win though, that's a good win for him. All right. But then again, Leon Spinks had the Yali win and uh, so on and so forth. But this was not an old Michael Dokes. This was not a what I know Michael Dokes, again, had substance abuse problems. That's well documented. Uh, I'm not sure if he was having substance abuse problems around the time of this fight. Uh, but be that as it may, this was not ostensibly an over the hill Michael Dokes that he fought. All right. Um, so that has to be considered a decent win. But other than that, he got battered by everybody he stepped up against, right? The John Tates, the Mike Weavers, the Ronaldo Snipeses, the Greg Pages, even Aaron Barkley at the end. So he's got to be a contender for one of the weaker heavyweight champions in history, no doubt. Then we move on to Primo Carnera, who I've really, I've already spoken about. You know, he was just a, uh, a puppet for the mob. That's all he was. There are books written about him. I think there's even a movie about him. I swear there's a movie about Primo Carnero. But there's certainly books written about him and his life and how utterly controlled he was by the mob. At the time, he was famous for being the biggest heavyweight champion in history. And even by today's standards, he's a big man. Six foot five and a half, 85 inch reach uh, from Italy. And again, you know, this is... <laughs> An example of how ridiculous it is for anybody to come out and proclaim that they know who the weakest heavyweight champion in history was. There are far too many things you have to consider, far too many fights you have to watch, far too many opponents that these guys have fought that you would have to watch, and you would have to understand the context of the time to be coming out and saying, so-and-so is the weakest heavyweight champion of all time. It's an absurd thing to say, but of course, it's being said by people who have an agenda to discredit you know who. <laughs> That's all this is about. Um, but anyway, I want to wrap this video up fairly quickly because I need to. I need to go bed, people. It's late. Um, Primo Carnera, very well known example of a, a, a weak heavyweight champion, a puppet heavyweight champion. That's what I was actually. I was. I forgot what I was trying to look for in his his resume. I'm trying to show you his weight. All right. Primo Carnera was an enormous man. Look at 266 pounds, 275, and he was in shape at this weight. This wasn't a fat guy. This was a guy who was in shape. So he was absolutely enormous, but he just couldn't fight. <laughs> he couldn't fight. The Amblin Alp, they used to call him. Anyway, moving on to Jimmy Ellis. Now, this was Muhammad Ali's sparring partner for many years, and he tried to fight like Ali, he even wore, uh, you know, the Ali white trunks with the black stripe. I mean, I call them Ali boxing shorts or, or trunks, but many fighters at that time wore the very same uh, color shorts. But yeah, he was Ali's sparring partner and lived in Ali's shadow, really. But he was, at one point, a uh, heavyweight champion. Now... If you look at his early career, you'll see losses here against, you know, fairly low level opposition. Don Fulmer and George Benton, actually, who, who went on to be, um, is that the same George Benton who, who was the trainer? It must be. <laughs> it must be. 
Yeah, it is. It's the same George Benton, the trainer George Benton. It's just weird seeing George Benton fighting up a uh, well. Okay, he it was a, actually a middleweight. My bad. I never, I, I never even realized. See, I'm learning something here. I never realized that Jimmy Ellis started his career at middleweight. Okay, and lost a few fights at middleweight. All right. I know Jimmy Ellis from his heavyweight days. Right? I wasn't born in the 1970s, so we can all learn something. There. See, again, I'm somebody with a lot of boxing knowledge, but I would never come out and say I know who the weakest heavyweight champion in history is. Because I don't know every single heavyweight champion. I know a lot more of them than 99% of boxing fans do. But, you know, even I could never come out with the knowledge I have and say, because there's so much I don't know. I, mean, I, I never knew Jimmy Ellis turned pro at flipping middleweight. <laughs> Crazy. Anyway, when he stepped up to heavyweight, that's what I do know about his wins over Oscar Bonavena and Jerry Quarry of Floyd Patterson. Patterson, obviously... Had seen much better days by the time Jimmy Ellis fought him. But uh, Leotis Martin, he obviously knocked out Sonny Liston. So that was a good win. Oscar Bonavena was a you know, tough contender. Uh, Jerry Quarry. These were decent wins at the time, to be fair. Yeah. Then he went in there against Joe Frazier and got wiped out. That was one of Joe Frazier's best performances. Fought Muhammad Ali, obviously, his former boss. And got defeated in that fight. Uh, strung together a few wins. Knocked out by Ernie Shavers. Yeah, and it was a wrap from there on in. Fought Joe Frazier a second time and would stop too. <sighs> beaten by Joe Bugner. Beaten by Ron Lyle. So, yeah, that was Jimmy Ellis's career. But to be fair, given the fact that he did have those wins over Bonavena Quarry, Leotis Martin. Yeah, I, I wouldn't put him right up there at the very top when it comes to the weakest heavyweight champions in history. But he's certainly not one of the strongest. That's for sure. All right, moving on. Greg Page, who I've spoken about, like so many heavyweights in the 80s, had substance abuse problems. Uh, but Page was tipped for big things. Page was somebody who had a lot of promise. A lot of people expected big things out of Greg Page. But yeah, the substance abuse issues just never allowed him to fulfill his potential. But he was somewhat talented, Greg Page. Yeah. But he's somebody who aged very quickly as well. If you see Greg Page early on in his career, he looked pretty decent. But, I mean, not even that far into his career, he was looking like an old man. <laughs> all right, so he strung all these wins together. And at this point, you know, people are believing in him. Then he lost to Trevor Burbick. And, well, you see what happened in his career from then on in. Beat Jimmy Young. That is the same Jimmy Young who fought George Foreman and Muhammad Ali. Um, lost to Trevor Burbick. James Tillis was a fringe contender at the time. Uh, Ronaldo Snipes. Lost to Tim Witherspoon. Lost to David Bay. Did have the win over Coltsy. Lost to Tubbs. Lost to Buster Douglas. Um, lost to Mark Wills. I remember the Mark Wills fight. Oh my God. That knockout was crazy. <laughs> if any of you ain't seen Greg Page versus Mark Wills, go look that fight up. That was crazy. Uh, Greg Page was getting worked over round after round by Mark Wills. Uh, but a knockout never looked lightly. And, and Mark Wills was just a journeyman himself. He was five and five, right? With a draw. So he, he was just a, a, a journeyman himself. And Mark Wills used to spar a lot of the uh, top heavyweights at the time. So the fight was kind of going along at this like pedestrian type of pace. It was quite a Morley fight with Mark Wills, a shorter heavyweight, just pushing Greg Greg Page up against the ropes and clubbing away. But at the start of one of the rounds, I'm sure it was the start of a round. And not, was it the start of the round or the end of the round? But it, it, I think it was at the start of one of the rounds. I'm sure it was. Mark Wills came out and he hit Greg Page with this looping overhand right and flattened him. <laughs> he literally flattened the guy. Just one punch that appeared to come out of nowhere. And the way he threw it, it was like a cricketer. You know when a cricketer, a bowler in cricket, when they're bowling, and it's like a overarm throw? That was how Mark Wills threw his right hand against Greg Page. <laughs> it just flipping wiped him out. I remember that fight very vividly, the Mark Wills, because it was just such a memorable knockout. I think I saw that on Eurosport as well back in the days. 
Um, all right, Joel Bognar, all in Norris, former you know guy who's a cruiserweight champion. Mark Wills again. Hang on. Which one? I, I I only saw him fight Mark Wills once. So which fight did I see of Mark Wills? I never saw two Mark Wills fights. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. See, I'm thinking of the wrong one. The first Mark Wills fight, this was this. All right, where he retired in nine. Okay, th yeah, I didn't see this fight. <laughs> My bad, people. This is not the fight I saw. I must have seen the Mark Wills rematch. <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> Jesus, he just got flattened. Did he fight Mark Wills three times? Let me flip and double check. Okay. Yeah, all right. So, yeah, I didn't see the first Mark Wills fight. That was a former forum in Inglewood. Down twice? Retired in nine? See, it's so, so long ago that I saw these fights, but I, I'm sure he was knocked out in the, the Mark Wills fight that I saw. This this says TKO at Caesar's Palace. I'm sure it was at Caesar's Palace, not Ingle, Inglewood. I can't remember now. That was in 86, and this one was 90. I think it was 99. Okay, I'm going to say it was the set. It was the rematch. I'm pretty sure it was the rematch when he got hit with a big overhand right. Yeah, it must have been a rematch. It must have been a rematch. Anyway, let me, let me stop getting sidetracked here, people. I'm trying to reminisce over fights in the 1990s and 80s. Obscure fights. Uh... Greg Page has to be up there as a contender for weakest heavyweight champion in history. He was talented, but as I say, substance abuse problems led him to have a disappointing career where he just ended up being a punch bag for a lot of the uh, top contenders. And even some of the fringe contenders used him as a punch bag, you know. Trevor Burbick. Uh, Burbick, most famous for being knocked out by Mike Tyson in two rounds so that Tyson could become the youngest heavyweight champion in history. Uh, originally from Jamaica, but fought out of Canada. The many memorable moments in Trevor Burbick's career. He's also famous for being the last man to fight Muhammad Ali. That was in Nassau, Bahamas. Um, put up a good effort against Larry Holmes. But in terms of his wins, what, what was his best win, Trevor Burbick? It was maybe Big John Tate. And John Tate, as I've explained, is one of the weakest heavyweight champions in history himself. So Trevor Burbick was always a brave guy, as most Jamaican fighters are. And I'm talking about fighters who are born and raised in Jamaica. I don't mean fighters who, you know, have Jamaican parents or whatever, and they're raised in the UK or wherever. No, I'm talking about born and raised Jamaican fighters are normally people with tremendous heart. There are a few exceptions, like... Nicholas Walters didn't exactly show that much heart against um, Lomachenko, but for the most part, the Jamaican fighters are extremely brave. And Trevor Burbick was certainly one of them. Very brave man. But was he a good heavyweight champion? Hell to the nizzle. <laughs> he was not a good heavyweight champion. Let's have a brief look at his career here. First loss in 79 was to Bernardo Mercado, somebody I've talked about briefly or mentioned briefly. Uh, before in this video, not tight in one round by Mercado. See, a lot of people, especially Tyson fans, are under this false impression that Burbick had never been knocked out before Mike Tyson fought him. No, he had been knocked out, and even quicker, he'd been knocked out in one round by Bernardo Mercado in 79, okay? Many years before he fought Mike Tyson. <sighs> had a draw a couple fights later, Leroy Coldwell. There was the win over John Tate. And he hit John Tate with a couple shots, Trevor Burbick. And John Tate went running across the ring because he was like discombobulated. He was dazed. And like John Tate was like stumbling across the ring, like running away from Trevor Burbick. <laughs> and Burbick chased him and whacked him a couple times. Like he didn't hit him in the back. Did he hit him on the back of the head? I think he might have hit him on the back of the head, but he, he chased John Tate across the ring while John Tate had his back to him and he was hitting John Tate in the head and then John Tate went down. And I remember uh, Freddy Pacheco was one of the commentators for the fight. <laughs> and Freddy Pacheco was obviously a fight doctor. So he was giving the people instructions of what to do with John Tate. 
uh, as well as commentating, you know, from ringside. He was like, oh, turn him on his side or whatever it was. Yeah, I remember that. So there's a John Tate fight. It was one of his better wins. Uh, put up a spirited effort against Larry Holmes, but lost. For Muhammad Ali, obviously, a totally ancient Ali who shouldn't have been in the ring and really had Parkinson syndrome at the time. Did have to win over Greg Page, took Greg Page's unbeaten record, and that was a decent win. But again, when, in retrospect, when you look at Page's career, how good was Page? He wasn't very good. Yeah, he had talent, but the talent wasn't fulfilled, was it? Lost to Snipes, lost to S.T. Gordon, Ken LaCousta, was a journeyman heavyweight at the time. Uh, one of the most impressive things about Ken LaCousta was watching him sparring Mike Tyson. Because he, he showed some toughness in them spars with Tyson, boy. <laughs> Ken LaCousta also fought George Foreman, and he kind of shook George Foreman. Foreman was on the brink of knocking LaCousta out, and LaCousta hit Foreman with like a big, you know, was it a right hand he hit him? He hit him with some big shot anyway, right before Foreman was about to knock him out. And Foreman said he was stunned by that punch, you know. But Foreman had a, had a, a way of uh, disguising when he was hurt quite well, particularly when he was an older fighter. But yeah, Ken Lacusta showed some toughness in them sparring sessions with Tyson, boy. You can watch them on YouTube. Um, what else here? All right, I went over David Bay's fairly decent. Uh, Mitch Green, Crackhead, Pinkland Thomas. Yeah, there's a few others. So Trevor Burbick, one of the weaker heavyweight champions in history, definitely. But would he be a, a, a leading contender for the, the worst? I would have to say no. You know, especially in retrospect, when you look back and you see he did have some decent wins. Um, did have some decent wins. So, yeah, he's up there as one of the weaker heavyweight champions, but definitely not the weakest. Herbie Hyde. Most British boxing fans above a certain age should know who Herbie Hyde is. Former WBO World Heavyweight Champion. Uh, Hyde was never really a heavyweight. And he admitted that later on in his career, he was a cruiserweight masquerading as a heavyweight. He was a, a pretty hard puncher, Herbie Hyde, despite his small size. Pretty quick, but defensively poor. And he had some of the worst punch resistance I've ever seen for a person calling himself a heavyweight. Right? I say he's not a heavyweight, but at the end of the day, he was fighting at heavyweight. And he was weighing above 200 pounds for most of his heavyweight fights, so... In that sense, technically, he was a heavyweight. And for someone who is technically a heavyweight, he had absolutely atrocious punch resistance. I mean, he just... I remember... I think it was prior to him losing to Riddick Bowe. Or prior to... Was it prior to the, the Bow loss? Or the Klitschko loss? It might have been prior to the Klitschko loss. My bad. When he lost to Vitaly Klitschko. He'd been sparring Danny Williams. Now, he used to spar Danny Williams a lot. Right? Danny Williams was someone who he liked to spar. Danny Williams didn't like sparring Herbie Hyde. Danny Williams didn't like Herbie Hyde at all. They, they did not like each other. Uh, and Herbie Hyde used to try and beat the absolute crap out of his sparring partners. That's what Herbie Hyde was known for. He was a vicious guy. That's one thing I have to say about Hyde. He was vicious. Right, and he would try to absolutely destroy people in sparring. And Danny Williams was told, you know, he was going to go up, I guess, by his coach or whatever. We've got sparring with Herbie Hyde again. And Danny Williams in his head was thinking, oh, no, not again. I hate sparring this guy because it's always like some hostile situation. And Hyde is this temperamental character. And Danny Williams didn't want to go up and spar him. But he ended up going up there. And in one particular session, when he was sparring Herbie Hyde, Herbie Hyde came out fast. Danny Williams stuck a jab on him. And according to Williams and, you know, people who were there, he basically knocked Herbie Hyde out with a jab. Now, Danny Williams, obviously a lot bigger than Herbie Hyde in terms of his physical weight. Around the same height, but weight-wise, Danny Williams is, you know, a lot bigger. And he stuck a jab on Herbie Hyde and Hyde went... <laughs> Hyde went down. There are conflicting reports. I've heard Danny Williams say he knocked Hyde out, but other people say it was just a knockdown and Hyde got up and you know, whatever the case may be. But still, Hyde was somebody who had a very suspect chin for anyone campaigned in a heavyweight. 
And as far as his career, we can see he turned pro at 188 pounds. His idol was always Muhammad Ali, Herbie Hyde. So it was always his intention to step up to heavyweight and campaign there. But essentially early on in his career, he was a cruiserweight. Uh, the fact that he fought Cornbury Nelson, I remember at the time thinking that was crazy because Cornbury Nelson was somebody who Mike Tyson knocked out when Tyson was on the way up as a contender about six or seven years earlier. <laughs> and Hyde was fighting Cornroy Nelson, a former Tyson victim. It's like, how how long did these journeymen stick around for? Uh, for Jean Chanet, the former European heavyweight champion who Lewis beat. Again, these are, this is nothing special. It's not nothing special to be fe- beating these people. These are just names I recognize on his resume. Some fights I remember. Uh, James Pritchard. Michael Murray. Michael Murray was for Manchester. I actually think I remember the Murray fight. I swear, I swear I remember the Murray fight. I certainly saw Michael Murray fight a whole heap of times. A black guy from Manchester. Um, Bigfoot Everett Martin. I mean, he's fighting nobodies at this point. Again, no disrespect to, to any of those guys, but he's fighting nobodies. His first opponent with a pulse, he also fought Mike Dixon. Mike Dixon was a tough guy. He was a journeyman but he was tough fought Lennox Lewis as well Mike Dixon tough guy um, Everett Martin fought people like Michael Mora uh, anyway he'd fought literally nobody as you can see then he fought Michael Bent who himself was one of the weakest heavyweight champions in history knocked out Michael Bent at Millwall I remember that fight well uh, then he fought Riddick Bowl in his fight after that and got absolutely destroyed by Riddick Bowl he was down god knows how many times was it like five times before the fight was stopped, well, it says KO here, so I guess he didn't beat the count. But I remember one of the boxing publications at the time, they said that Herbie Hyde should have employed a cutsman for his knees in the Riddick Bowl fight. Because that's... <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, people. Excuse me. Pardon me. <laughs> but he, he should have employed a cutsman for his knees the amount of times he went down on his knees against Riddick Bowl. Uh, so yeah, he got destroyed by Riddick Bowl. I remember that fight. They actually showed it on the BBC. I'm not sure if it, it was shown on Sky Live, but I remember watching it on the BBC. Um, Herbie Hyde versus Riddick Bowl with that Irish guy doing the commentary. So yeah, was destroyed by Riddick. So he'd fought nobody, beat nobody. Then he fought Michael Bent, you know, who was a one-hit wonder himself against Tommy Morrison. Fought Riddick Bowl, got destroyed. I fought Michael Murray again. In fact, it might be the Michael Murray rematch that I remember. Because this was at the Goresbrook Leisure Center in Dagenham. That might not have even been televised. I don't know. But I, I've got a, a feeling that it was the Michael Murray rematch that I probably saw and remember. Frankie Swindell. I remember that fight. Frankie Swindell uh, was grossly overweight at the time. And I remember him you know, knocking Swindell out. Um... Okay, he had a, a KO win over an absolutely washed up to pieces, punch drunk, slur in his words, Tony Tucker. I remember that. <laughs> and, he, and I'm not exaggerating in terms of the, the state that Tony Tucker was in when Herbie Hyde fought him. He was in a terrible state, fat, overweight, old, punch drunk as hell, you know, could barely string a sentence together. Um, that's who Herbie Hyde fought there. Then was the Vitaly Klitschko fight. And, and remember... He actually won the vacant WBO title against Tony Tucker. I mean, how is this for a title reign? You fight an ancient Tucker who's punch drunk, old, totally washed up for a vacant belt. You defend against Damon Reed. Who is Damon Reed? Then you defend against Willie Fisher. Who is Willie Fisher? I need... Boxing Beats and Rams, one of the older heads, one of the old boxing historian guys to tell me who the hell are these men? <laughs> I got no idea who they are. Then he fought Vitaly Klitschko. Now, the Klitschko fight, a lot of people believe that he got knocked out by a phantom punch, a punch that didn't hit him. Okay, because if you watch the fight, it, it, at first, it appears that Klitschko hits him with a grazing right hand, and that ends the fight. 
But that's not what happened. He gets dropped by Klitschko, gets back up. Then he's scrambling around the ring. And he appears to go down from a punch that doesn't connect. A, a right hand that, that grazes his neck and goes over his shoulder. But that's not what happens. If you watch very closely, Vitaly Klitschko hits Herbie Hyde with a jab to the face. And it's the jab that knocks him out. But it's a delayed action fall. So the jab knocks him out. And then the right hand misses and, and Hyde sinks to the canvas. A lot of people miss that. But if you watch in slow motion, you'll see that Vitaly Klitschko's jab knocks Herbie Hyde out. And again, that was one of the biggest problems for Herbie Hyde was uh, his complete lack of punch resistance at heavyweight. Uh, one of the things I remember about Herbie Hyde as well is that he had... Uh, a brother who I believe was an adopted brother, because I think Herbie Hyde was adopted. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, people. I don't want to be speaking out of turn, but I believe Herbie Hyde was adopted. And he also had an adopted uh, kid brother, a little, little mixed race boy who was sick with cancer or some kind of illness, leukemia, whatever it was. It was really sad, but he used to turn up at Herbie Hyde's fights and you know, be in the ring afterwards. And Herbie had really loved him. You know, it was a bit of a touching story with uh, his little brother with cancer. And eventually, really tragically and unfortunately, his little brother did succumb to the cancer or whatever terminal illness it was and he died. Uh, but I always remember that. I always remember the, the little boy coming in the ring for Herbie Hyde's fights. But yeah, the Klitschko fight, he got wiped out. Then he was knocked out by Joseph Chingangu. I think Chingangu was Congolese. I remember that fight. Uh, beat Chingangu in the rematch. And then late on in his career, he campaigned at Cruiserweight. And, you know, strung together some wins against God knows who. <laughs> you tell me who these guys are, people. Strung together wins against God knows who, literally. So, yeah, that's Herbie Hyde. Herbie Hyde definitely, without question has to be a contender for weakest heavyweight champion of all time. That's not to say Herbie Hyde wasn't talented, uh, but he was f far better suited as a cruiserweight. As a heavyweight, he just did not have the punch resistance to be able to compete with any of the top guys. You know, and like I say, the best win in Herbie Hyde's career was over Michael Ben. That's it. Every other time he stepped up, he got absolutely battered. Uh, unless you want to say Tony Tucker, who was ancient and washed up and punch drunk at the time. So Herbie I did nothing in the heavyweight division, but he was at one point considered a heavyweight champion of sorts. Because again, to be fair, the WBO was not universally recognized at this time. Uh, it was gaining more recognition. And obviously Riddick Bowl held it after he beat Hyde. But, you know, I do have to say that in all fairness. Anyway, then we move on to more recent times. In fact, let me deal with Sam Peter first. Sam Peter also has to be a contender for one of the weakest heavyweight champions of all time. Uh, I believe Sam Peter is the first black African heavyweight champion ever. Because obviously, Coltsy was a white South African. But in terms of a native African, a black African, I think Sam Peter was the first ever. African heavyweight champion. I'm 100% sure he was actually. 99.9% .9 sure. Um, unless there's some obscure heavyweight I don't know about from the 19, early night, early 20th century, there might be. <laughs> you know, might be some obscure heavyweight champion from back then who was born in Africa. I don't know. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, he was the first black African heavyweight champion. So we'll go through his early career, fighting the usual. Who's He, list of journeymen. Charles Shufford. Charles Shufford actually played George Foreman in the Muhammad Ali movie starring Will Smith. <laughs> Weirdly enough. Yeah, Charles Shufford played Foreman in that uh, movie. But he wasn't very good. Uh, who else is here? Jovo, Pudar. That name rings a bell. And Jeremy Willi Oh, the Jeremy Williams knockout, right? Williams was, you know, on, on very much on the decline. And Williams was never any good as a heavyweight anyway. Williams was a pretty good amateur and he was talented, Williams, but he just had no chin, uh, poor defense, and he just went nowhere as a heavyweight, Jeremy Williams. But he was 
a contender who had a certain amount of hype around him early on in his career, Jeremy Williams. I remember when he beat, um, who was that Kronk fighter? Oh God, Donnell Nicholson. Yeah, Donnell Nicholson. Jeremy Williams beat Donnell Nicholson. He was a Kronk fighter tra- trained by Manny Stewart. And that kind of put Jeremy Williams on the map. But then uh, Jeremy Williams was beaten by Larry Donald. And it was downhill from there on for Jeremy Williams. But yeah, by this time, Jeremy Williams, you know, he had four losses and a draw. He was up there in his 30s and he was pretty much on, on, on a serious decline by the time he fought Sam Peter. But nonetheless, that was a, high, a highlight reel knockout when Sam Peter knocked out Jeremy Williams with one left hook in the second round and it was frightening. He hit Williams with his left hook. Williams went down immediately like he'd been shot. His legs were quivering. You know when people properly get knocked out? That's how Jeremy Williams was in the Sam Peter fight. His legs were quivering. His arms were stiff and stuff like that for a few seconds. Scary knockout. Scary knockout that was. Uh, who else does that? And by the way, Sam Peter is one of those African sportsmen whose age was disputed. And I first heard this from African people before I started hearing it from uh, people within the boxing, within boxing circles in, in London. I was hearing it from African people, like Nigerian people. They were saying this Sam Peter guy is not the age that he claims he is. <laughs> so he was somebody who, yeah, he was supposed to be in his 20s when he fought Jeremy Williams, but people were saying the guy's already in his 30s. But anyway, uh, you know, beat all these nondescript opponents, Taurus Sykes. Then he put in a spirited effort against Vladimir Klitschko. Now, you have to understand, Vladimir Klitschko in this fight was still dealing with the trauma of being knocked out by Corey Sanders, by uh, Lamont Brewster, by uh, Ross Purity. And after the Lamont Brewster loss, Vitaly Klitschko told Vladimir that Vladimir should retire. His own brother told him to retire. His own brother didn't think he had what it, it, it took to make it at the top level. So Klitschko was very unsure of himself going into the Peter fight. And he was dropped several times by Sam Peter. And I, I would argue with anyone to this day, Vladimir Klitschko wasn't really hurt for any of the knockdowns in this fight. He wasn't really hurt. He was more anxious because when he got hit, it brought back memories of his previous uh, KO defeats. You know, kind of like um, post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, that veterans have when they come back from war and they hear a car backfiring and, you know, <laughs> all of a sudden they're jumping out of their bed in a cold sweat. Uh, it, it's not that extreme with boxers usually, but it's a mild form sometimes when fighters have suffered knockout defeats and stuff like that. They might suffer something which is similar to a very mild form of post-traumatic stress disorder, some fighters. And to me, that's what Klitschko appeared to be suffering from in the uh, Sam Peter, the first Sam Peter fight. Because Sam Peter was hitting it with grazing punches. And I know he's a heavy-handed guy. Um, well, well, I'm, I, better, I better bring this thing to an end here, people. I'm running out of space. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, Sam Peter was a heavy-handed guy, but, um, you know, Klitschko was not in a good place mentally at that point, And he was going down from shots that later on in his career, I don't think he would have gone down from grazing punches that weren't even catching him properly. Uh, but yeah, so he lost to Klitschko in a spirited effort, Sam Peter. This was not the Klitschko who we know later on, you know, this was Klitschko when he was still unsure of himself coming off knockout losses uh so what else did sam peter do really nothing he beat oleg maskayev james tony twice an ancient fat tony campaigning a heavyweight when he should never have been a heavyweight uh jamil mccline he was actually dropped in that fight so yeah uh, i can't stay on this too long because i think my computer is about to pack up <laughs> because this recording is uh so long that it's messing with the memory i think and this is a flipping expensive laptop as well. 
Anyway, yeah, Sam Peter, he's got to be considered for one of the weakest heavyweight champions of all time. And so does Ber- Berman Stavern. Now, people try to correct me and say it's Berman Stavern, not Berman. Well, he pronounces his name Berman. So that's the reason why I started saying it was Berman. Because that's how he himself pronounces it and insists that other people pronounce it. And again, just to get through this quickly, what has Berman Stavern ever done in his career? He beat Chris Ariola for a vacant belt. That's it. That's it. So we don't need to go through his. That's fairly recent, and you guys know all about Burma Mr. Vern. He is definitely a contender for one of the weakest heavyweight champions in history. So anyway, I'm done here, people. Uh, hopefully this has been somewhat enlightening uh, for you guys. It's been somewhat enlightening for me. I've learned a couple things I didn't know, like Jimmy Ellis turned pro at middleweight. But bottom line is, people, you can't be coming out and proclaiming anybody to be the weakest heavyweight champion of all time unless you've got knowledge of all the heavyweight champions that have existed in history. And I've only gone through a few of them. There are there are many, many other relatively obscure heavyweight champions from boxing history. I've only gone through a few. There are many others. Yeah. So again... You can't be coming out your mouth making statements like so-and-so is the weakest in history if you don't have knowledge of all the heavyweight champions and you know who they fought and you know the context of the time and how good each win was and who their opponent is. It's silly, but it's being said by people who, number one, don't know nothing about boxing and number two, they're trying to push an agenda to discredit one of the heavyweight champions at the moment. (laughs) That's all this is about. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Catch you on the next one. It's happening. I'm out. Join me on Patreon. I upload a minimum of two podcasts every single week, covering a wide variety of controversial topics, as well as live stream Q&A sessions. Take a look on screen right now at some of the podcasts I've produced so far. For just $3 a month, the equivalent of about £2 a month, you get access to all my new podcasts and my entire back catalogue of past podcasts, including my popular Confessions of a Nightclub Bouncer series. You can listen on your computer or on your smartphone or tablet by downloading the Patreon app from the Google Play Store or the App Store for free. The Patreon app also allows you to download each podcast in MP3. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, you get access to dozens of hours of exclusive content. It's easy to sign up, there's no contract, and you can cancel at any time. So come and join our community of free and critical thinkers by signing up with me here on Patreon today.